Okay, so speaking of people who've regularly participated in our data summit, Nina said she's gone to, to them every year. Professor Jana Diesner has been a regular participant as well, and she's also one of the data science experts in residence for the research park. So she helps companies, she helps with our data science user group as well. But a little bit more about Jana as well. So she is an associate professor in the iSchool, and she is an expert in informatics. In particular, she works in the field of social science computational analysis, and I am sure she will tell you more about that. She has a PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University and has been at the iSchool for I think it's eight years now, uh, inspiring many students with her work and teaching, but also research that has a human impact and includes nonprofit organizations as well as working with industry. So take it away, Jana. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that the research park decided to do this online and that I at least have a chance to see many of the regulars who used to come to the Big Data Summit online and also lots of new folks. It's such a pleasure to have this large audience online and still finding a way to engage. All right, let me share my screen here. So we have some slides for you all. Here we go. Um, Laura, can you give me a quick um, visual feedback or say something if you can, if you guys can see my slides all right? Can't see your slides yet, but I'm going to also say there was a question in the Amobi presentation about bias in algorithms and your oh, talk okay. is going to be on biases in data sciences. So I'm hopeful that you will give some perspective, especially as an expert in this area at the University of Illinois. All right, so let's go ahead here. So um, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about um, biases in data science. And instead of only looking at algorithmic biases, I'll try to keep this a little more comprehensive. And it's nothing new to worry about people have been using data and the analysis of data to try to understand human and large scale social behavior for a very long time. I'm showing you, I'm starting here with a very old thing, an old study, well, from the 1960s, put it in perspective, um, from Stanley Milgram, who ran a um, experiment with a very moderate budget back then of, I think, $680, that was his funding he had, in order to understand how far away a random pair of people is in the US from each other, meaning people who don't know each other directly, how many intermediates does it take to get from one person to another? And he did this by basically sent out um, chain letters that people had to reply to. Um, and he got a total of 44 responses, so that's his end. Um, more, way more than the 44 um, dropped out somewhere on the way. But by doing this, by basically sending a letter to people and say, hey, do you know this person? If not, send this letter to somebody who might know this person and so on and so forth, he realized that the average distance between any two people in the US is about 5.43 people. Um, all right, okay. So that's a value from 1967. And then using big data and data science, um, years later in 2011, 2012, for example, this kind of idea was replicated by taking large scale data from social media, for example, um, in this case, Twitter and Facebook, and finding with um, search the shortest path between any two people, any two nodes in this big graph. And what people found was the distance is actually a little bit shorter, apparently. It's about Three and it's about three and a half people as opposed to a little more than five and a half people. All right, so we have two very different values here. We have something from the 60s that says average degree of separation is five something. And then things from later that say it's actually shorter. And a good question here to ask is why is that happening? Um, what accounts for these differences? Um, is it a difference in measurement, um, the way the data were collected and sampled, which is clearly very different. One of them is fast forward search by human agents, basically. The other is graph search, um, which is way faster to do. Um, it could also be that technology has brought us closer together and we all have a shorter distance from each other. 
Um, or it could be that methodological differences account for these seemingly um, different values. And the answer is, we don't know, um, research to be done here, but it's not clear what accounts for these differences. What is clear is that when we replicate, when we use data science, big data and algorithms um, to replicate studies that are often developed or were developed in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, based on observations of small to medium sized data over a long time, and we now replicate these studies by looking at a lot of big data at a very short amount of time, we sometimes come to very different conclusions about social behavior um, and the way humans interact with each other. Um, and there's a lot more research to be done to figure out why do we see these different results? Is this biases in methods or is it human behavior? So that's one aspect. Another aspect I want to show you um, is biases that can sometimes be revealed in large data we collect basically from the internet and use, for example, to build prediction models. And I want to give you an example here of a study, a um, very fascinating study that was done by Bulam uh, Vini and her colleague Gibru. Um, it's called Gender States. And what they did in the study was, their goal was to evaluate commercial AI tools um, that are built for computer vision. And they wanted to see how well do these tools do and predicting gender based on photos. So they built a very balanced data set. Um, they took photos from members of parliaments of six countries, three European countries, six African countries. And I'm showing you here some brief statistics on distributions of features they were using for analysis and one of them which they are predicting. So in the database uh, of many, many pictures they had, they had um, people um, organized into skin phenotypes with um, about 54% having a lot lighter skin tone and 45% of people having a, a darker skin tone and about 45% males and about 54%, um, uh, sorry, 45% females and about 54% males. And they realized that when they used this, um, when they um, used the three commercial tools that they tested to see how well they predict um, gender in these photos, they realized that all classifiers did actually pretty well, 88 to 94 percent. But they also realized that there are differences and error rates um, between groups. So, for example, they realized that um, all classifiers performed better in recognizing male faces than females, and performed better in um, detecting lighter than darker subjects. And they by far performed worse on um, darker females. So let's pause here for a second and think about why is that? Why are these tools giving us different results or accuracy or reliability for different types of people? So a question to ask, um, and that gets us a little bit more to other types of biases. Huh. Somehow my skin, uh, my. Uh, my slide is not moving forward. Here we go. Um, so sometimes uh, when you train tools, um, AI tools, machine learning tools, or big statistical tools on publicly available, big, found, user-generated data, basically data on the internet, um, sometimes you reveal and inherit um, biases that are in the data and that, doesn't, that don't come from a single data point but from the aggregate of a lot of data that is out there on the web. So for example, in this case, it could be the tools that have been trained on random data from the internet, photos on the internet, where you might happen to have way more photos of men than of women and of lighter um, skin subject than of darker skin subject that your machine learning algorithm inherits this distribution of class labels and brings that to the results. Um, all right, so let me dig a little bit deeper into these um, uh, gender biases that people sometimes are very interested in. It has been shown over and over and again in many studies that gender biases, um, the perpetuation of gender stereotypes, 
and imbalanced representation of gender in everyday language use can impact a lot of critical things such as hiring, promotion, promos, promotions, elections, and also prediction models. We not only see this in computer vision, we also see this in text data. For example, people have found out that when you use word embeddings, which is a very common method to train um, text mining classifiers, if you try to find equivalence um, relationships, for example, you give the computer a prompt and say, man is to king as woman is to what? Then the computer would come back from these data with a geometric interpretation um, of words and say, oh, it's like to queen or man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. So you see um, how large scale data that we have on the web and that have been generated often by many, many people might inherit, bi might inherit biases that then our technology reveals. I wanna show you another example. Um, this is also a thing that has been shown with statistical data analysis. Sharon Chavit here from the University of Illinois did analyze a couple of years back um, the damage that hurricanes that made landfall in the United States have been causing. And she found that um, hurricanes that have a female name are more deadly than hurricanes that um, have a male name. And they were wondering why that is. And one hypothesis was that maybe people assess or evaluate um, the danger of female named hurricanes um, differently than of male named hurricanes. So we wanted to do a, um, a complementary analysis based on text data. And um, my wonderful graduate students, Lee Din and Janina Saral, um, who are PhD um, students working in my group, um, helped to collect a whole bunch of text data over a long time span on a whole lot of hurricanes. This is also collaborative work with the Klein Center for Advanced Social Science Research here at the University of Illinois. And we wanted to see if these gender stereotypes are perpetuated to language use. Good news, not a whole lot. When people, uh, and by that we looked at journalists as well as citizens who get quoted, um, refer to biases, most often they do not use a gendered pronoun. Okay, that's good. But when they do, we again see significant differences in the results. So if people do use a gendered pronoun, they are more likely, four times more likely to do that for female um, named hurricanes than for male named hurricanes. And also the terms um, that refer to these hurricanes and that have an opinionated value, which we refer to as sentiment analysis, are more negative um, with reference to female named hurricanes than to male named hurricanes. This study is a little bit similar to the gender chase thing that I just showed you, where overall the accuracy is okay and the results are okay, but once you start looking into the differences, they are not um, equally distributed. There are differences there. So let's zoom a little bit out here. Um, what are these, what exactly are the problems when we look into biases in data science? One way I like to conceptualize this for myself, and then I would like to share with you here is there are basically two different kinds of sources. The first one is biases and people. Um, that, and by that, I don't mean personal perspective and culture and view. That, we like that. Um, we like studying these things. In fact, we have published many studies um, in my group and many, many people have where we really do appreciate um, differences between people and their cultures and viewpoints. And it's a good thing, an important thing to have. Different thing is if we take large scale big data from the web, use it um, or say, okay, these, these um, data points um, from social, social behavior, individual behavior, interactive behavior is kind of a model um, of, uh, built up from sensor data where people are sensors, right? They admit, sig uh, admit signals, we can build a model. And then the tools that we use in order to make these models practically useful to other people might reveal biases that are in the data and that not are coming from a single person, but from the aggregate. And in this case, and you all have probably seen plenty of examples in the news, AI, machine learning, big data, data science, 
is kind of a messenger who shows us, oh, all right, people actually do have certain biases that are detrimental to various um, processes and societies. Um, and then a good question here for us as people in tech or in interdisciplinary data science in general is, how can we detect, explain, and mitigate um, these, uh, these biases that tools inherit from data? So that's one side. In the other side, we have other biases. This, these are biases in doing science. So when any of you who is a data scientist or works on big data, builds a model, collects data, analyzes data, visualizes data, reports on data, you all have to make a lot of decisions. You cannot not make these decisions. You have to decide what's your sample, how, with what library you're gonna analyze it or with what tool, on what hardware you're gonna run this. And all of these decisions we have to make with respect to research design, to data collection, to sampling, algorithms, methods, tools, theories, they all do have an impact on the data and it's, kind of on us to understand these impacts and make sure we mitigate them when they are detrimental in a way that introduces biases and gives us a false view either on social behavior or on distribution of sensitive um, variables and so on and so forth. So here it's the, uh, the duty of us as tech workers or people working in tech to do the best they can to produce um, trustworthy and responsible results, findings, and tools um, that, that help people um, go about their business, um, do the things they need to do. So I'll show you two more examples or a few more examples of um, um, seeming biases and how they can get um, stronger or weakened through methodological choices. So a couple of years, a paper came out um, by King and his colleagues that basically showed that over the last many years, when people, when, when scholars write publications, um, you often put references on a publication, right? And they found that um, men tend to self-cite their own work more, and specifically 56% more than women do. Meaning when, when they write a paper, they might refer more often to their prior papers than women do that. Um, and this um, trend has gotten worse um, over the last years. So we were sitting there and thought, hmm, that's interesting. Why is that? And after talking a little, our hypothesis was that once we have clean and reliable data and measurement decisions, opportunity of uh, to self site meaning actually having prior papers, might be a confounding factor that should also be considered. So let's see how that went. The first thing we did was we basically replicated the original study. Both studies had a whole lot of papers from different sources. They had a good amount of self citations, um, both of these data sets. The King Bay paper um, for matching names or disambiguating names, they used something called name matching. It's a very common method. If you have Laura Frerichs and L Frerichs, you might want to consolidate them because you know they both refer to the same person, if you do know that. Um, so, so they did a couple of these like um, surface form string matching things to say these are the same names and these might be, uh, yeah, these are the same names. And then they built a very um, straightforward model to basically estimate the likelihood of self citation giving the author the paper um, that is um, being cited and the citing paper and then measure an effect size. All right, cool. So we replicated that. Um, we used a more rigorous way of data disambiguation. We used a database that has been built by Vetla Tor Torvik here at um, the University of Illinois at the iSchool. It's a wonderful tool. Whoever wants to do name disambiguation, I highly recommend his work. Um, it's highly accurate. Um, so we used that to disambiguate names and we found basically the same trend as the original study, meaning that men indeed do self cite more than women. Um, not the exact same numbers, but the same trend. But that only applies when we use the exact same prediction model. So that's the model in gray here. On the left-hand side, 
or the, yeah, you see a graph that's for first authors, that's typically the more junior contributors, depending on the field. And then you see a second chart here for last authors. Those are typically the more senior people, also can vary by field. Um, but the results are the same um, for both types of authors. If we only use gender as the only um, independent variable, um, to predict um, self-citation, then we indeed do see this, um, a gender difference. However, as soon as we add in other variables, confounding variables, such as um, prior citations, um, age of scholarly age, how long has this person been active, um, how long has the prior paper been out on the market and be available for citation, and so on and so forth, as soon as we add in these other variables, the gender effect goes away. In fact, it actually flips a tiny little bit. So you can see that the pink bubbles here that represent women, um, if you add in a lot of additional relevant variables, or as we believe relevant variables, then women actually are not self-citing uh, less than men. And this, this idea of um, adding more variables, controlling for more factors, um, reversing your actual original outcome is sometimes called um, Simpson's paradox. So um, if gender is not actually the culprit for self-citation differences, then what is? And in order to test that, we looked at basically attrition rates of women in the workforce. And we saw that, so red bars here are women, blue bars are men. And on the left side, you see people who ended their career in the data we have. So basically they, they were no longer active. We looked at people who started their career in the data set we had, um, which is an overtime data set. And we looked at people who started and ended their career. And we basically saw that women have shorter lifespans in the biomedical workforce, which gives them simply less of a chance to be productive, which then gives them less of a chance to self-cite. Um, so what we see here is, Yes, there might be sometimes differences, but once you control for more factors, you might get higher explanatory power of why something happened. Um, and just the last word on self-citation. Um, overall, we also saw that self-citation is the hallmark of successful um, authors. So if any of you is wondering whether they should self-cite or not, go for it, do it. It's a good thing. All right, um, I'll show you one more example. So one um, theory that's often used to explain interactions between people is this thing called triadic closure. Um, and that basically means that if, for example, I, when I write a paper with one of my um, graduate students, Charlie Rezapur, who you see here, and another one with um, one of my other students, Lee Din, then over time, there is a higher likelihood that Lee and Charlie will also work together um, because they are introduced to each other, because they are in the same environment. And it has been shown in very many studies that this um, triadic closure, um, this open, um, open triplet in the, in the bottom there, also connecting, is a very common effect. And it is practically used a lot, for example, for link prediction and recommender systems. So we used four large scale data sets to see how true this um, theory is in contemporary large scale big data settings. We used four different data sets over time, over many years with a few hundred thousand papers. And instead of doing what people typically do to measure triadic closure, which is typically has been done with statistical estimation, we did a very simple thing and a thing that big data allows you to do. We didn't estimate anything we counted. We counted because we had full data on a couple of communities and even on a full country. So there we didn't have to estimate anything. We basically looked for open triads and then we gave people one to 10 years to close these triads and we empirically checked if after that many years, people actually did close these triads. And I'm showing here some results. The upper two lines are statistical estimate measures that are very commonly used for checking for this closure of triad and predicting the linkage of people or suggesting links between people. Um, and these measures range highly between 25 to 50%. But if we don't estimate, if we actually empirically check for evidence and high quality data, we see this rate is much, much lower. It's between one to 7%. 
which means it's still an effect happening, but it's not explaining the majority of why people interact with each other, collaborate with each other, work together. Um, so let's zoom out here and summarize what we've looked at. Um, when we do science, when we do data science, when we work with big data, we have to make a lot of decisions about how to collect our data, how to prepare it, what algorithms to use, what metrics to use for analysis. And all these choices can have an impact on the results we are finding. Big data does not make this issue go away. In fact, it can even be worse if you have a lot of data and ignored all these um, nuanced questions. You can easily introduce um, biases and error rates um, that can be avoided. All right. So what solutions do we have to work against these biases? Um, data quality is one angle, and I've shown you a couple of examples. Working on methods and making sure the algorithms and variables we use are responsible and accurate and all that. And of course, also what we are doing today, outreach, public engagement, producing open science that hopefully allow the general public to understand how can they know what facts and research outcomes to trust and why? And for everybody um, here who is a scientist or researcher or works in tech, um, what are biases that are important to look out for and how can we mitigate them? Um, I'm ever so thankful to my sponsors. I also wanna um, acknowledge my lab um, and my lab members for all the work they have provided to, to some of these studies. And with that, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jana. So Professor Diesner, as we'd mentioned at the beginning, works in the iSchool and has affiliations across campus, including with the research park. I hope you enjoyed the presentation she gave about bias, which unfortunately had some hard data to hear, Jana, not necessarily what we want to hear. And um, there's certainly, I think, a, a desire to make improvements as well. So we do have a question of just, um, is the decisions we make overall based on bias, in your opinion, um, that we're seeing in data? Oh, okay. can you say the question again? I think it's a general question, but I'll say uh, somebody was asking, did the decisions we make, uh, are they the result of biased data? And Sometimes, um, but it's also uh, it's also on the people who make decisions, policymakers, managers, to have the ability to correctly see results and act upon them. What is a confidence interval? What does a likelihood value mean? What does this visualization suggest? So the whole pipeline from data collection to analysis to um, policy and decision making offers room for good and bad choices. And I would highly recommend collaboration there and talking to folks and people from different teams to, to find these different sources and things are only getting more complicated, understand them. So I'm sorry, we're, we don't have a lot of time for more questions, but I'll say Jana Diesner again is available as an expert in residence in the research park. And I provided a link in the chat to her faculty profile and the link to her expert um, in residence position. She's also involved, as I mentioned, in the data science user group. That meetup group meets the first Friday of every month. So please join Yana and others interested in data, data on a monthly basis and learn and discuss these topics that have been increasingly, I think, common to talk about bias. Yeah, in fact, we had our last session last week um, on biases and ethics and accountability. So come all join the Urbana Champagne Data Science User Group. The Research Park is supporting that. Thanks, Laura, for having me. I will make an effort to go through the questions here and answer whatever questions we did, didn't capture yet. And people are more than welcome to reach out to us either through the Research Park or to me directly. We'd be happy to talk more to you. Thanks, Jana.